Welcome to Instrumental Breakthroughs, everybody. I'm your host, Daniel Shankin, and I'm the director of Mount Town Psychedelic Integration. We offer um, psychedelic integration coaching and educational events uh, worldwide at this point. Uh, we also co-host this podcast with Deadhead Land. Um, so thank you to Brian for allowing us to use your platform and supporting us so much. Um, we both have Patreons, if you want to support that, a slight, um, slight advertisement or bid, a bid for support. Um, we'd also like to ask that you support uh, folk medicine. Folk medicine is where I met Joanna, and it is a project where medicine musicians, med musicians of all types, get together to raise awareness and funds for indigenous people in South America, indigenous tribes who are suffering greatly from COVID and other health health issues. And so, if you're somebody who enjoys um, plant medicine, you know a little bit of kind of sacred reciprocity by supporting um, that project um, a little bit would go a long way. And, and with that said, you know, I would love to introduce my guest who I met, who I met watching her perform at Folk Medicine. I was kind of very impressed by, you know, the quality and the depth of, of your music. Um, I've come to learn from reading your bio and exploring your site that um, you're a multi-instrumentalist and you're a healer and a mystic and i'm really really interested in talking about all of those things um welcome welcome to the show joanna joanna warren thank everybody you. thank you so much for having me hello everyone and so generally what we do is we start out by talking about often like a pivotal moment where you had some sort of revelation or discovery when you were on some sort of entheogen or psychedelic and there's something sort of lit up or, or popped for you. And then how that sort of thread has kind of carried through your life and perhaps even how your music expresses that. Mm, beautiful, yeah. Um, the first time that I ever ate mushrooms, I was 18 and had just gotten out of high school and had been, really struggling with um, mental health and physical health since early childhood. And I was a very magically minded young person, like when I was um, three, four, five, just very um, intuitively, naturally connected to nature and the spirits of nature and just love spending all my days outside just playing with plants and experimenting with making potions and just um existing happily in the outside world and then i think through a pub a, a combination of public schooling and um eating a lot of foods that were not at all ideal for my body and just you know getting sucked into the mainstream media matrix, I totally lost my connection and I lost my sense of self that I inherently came into the world with. And I just got really, really sick and really sad. And um, the drugs that the doctors were throwing at me were only making things worse. So it was really um, just sort of a, a mess. And then my friend Sean, Sean, if you're listening, thank you, my friend, thank you Thanks, so Sean. much. <laughs> he um, introduced me to mushrooms um, after my senior year of high school, and it just completely reawakened my awareness of magic and just the all of the ways of being that I knew and had forgotten came back to me. And um, it really like, it, I remember thinking at the time, like, wow, you know, the all the Native American beliefs that we're to told about as white people in public school, you know, like the, the Native Americans, as if that's one group of people believe in the, the existence of spirits that inhabit all living things. And I remember, coming up on mushrooms and seeing the grass moving and the trees start to breathe and just thinking like 
wow, like those Native Americans must have been on mushrooms, you know? <laughs> but it's like now in retrospect with a more um, fully uh, fleshed out awareness, it's like humans are inherently connected to the um, aliveness of nature because we are nature and that's the way that we've evolved up until so recently you know we've been connected on like a molecular biology level to all life and plants tell us how to use them and we have been part of this web and it's really just so recently that we have um separated ourselves from that and i think that is the root of so much of our collective disease and disorders so that was, it was, it was a big moment for me. Just that one, that first experience was like just shattering all the um, illusions that had been clouding my vision for a really long time. And you were in nature when that happened, I'm assuming. I was, yeah, we, we ingested the mushroom tea in his basement and then we walked outside and mm -hmm. sat in a field and right. that's, of course, when everything got beautiful, it was kind of like a little bit disturbing at first inside. And that was something that I noticed throughout the trip was like when we were in nature, everything was so positive and um, sparkly. And then when we, we did take a walk into town and like went to the local pizza shop and that's when things got scary. Right. <laughs> were you yeah. even able to eat the pizza? No, 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 right. no. I walked into the bathroom and had a long uh, experience of just looking at my reflection and just watching my face morph into my dad's face and my grandma's face and just uh, probably Hitler, you know, just like every everyone and everything that I um, had uh, otherized, I guess. Like that's, I think maybe why they say don't look in the mirror, just, just um, being confronted with all of the things that you don't want to identify with and mm -hmm. having to like expand your sense of self to encompass that which is not actually other. Right, so you, you kind of have to really want it to be weird if you look in the mirror. Like you've got to be up for the challenge is what you're saying. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think if you're, if you're down to do mm -hmm. some real work. I think it's one of the best things you can do. Um, that was a, a later experience that I had with um, LSD was um, um, just lying in bed naked with a hand mirror and a roll of Kleenex or tissue paper and just just being there for hours, just like watching my face morph through all these like past lifetimes and all of these different um, fractal fragments of myself and just wrestling with all of that, like wrestling with all of these um, projections and judgments against myself, all of these things that I um, hold shame around and just learning to be with them mm -hmm. until I finally got to a place where it was like, I, I I think I worked through this desire to be pretty uh, and like feminine that had always haunted me and like pushed just straight through that into a clearing where suddenly it was like, you are so much bigger than any of that. Like you are ancient, you are timeless, you are wise and I trust you. Like that was the place that I ultimately mm -hmm. landed was like, I would walk through a desert um, behind you, like as my leader, like I trust you, I see your strength and I see mm. everything you've been through. And that it's so, that that is like the, <laughs> um, the strongest place I've ever found myself in relationship to myself, <laughs> if that makes right. sense. <laughs> Was in that bed with that hand mirror. Yes. Nice. You're reminding me of a time, and I, I didn't, I have to admit, I don't think I spent quite so much time in front of the mirror, but, you know, I went to the bathroom, then I looked in the mirror, and I noticed, depending on the thoughts that I was having, my visage, my face would either become, like, vibrant and alive and glowing and radiant, and on a dime, it could switch to sort of, like, 
decaying and depressing yes. and depleted and all of that stuff. And I was like, oh, right. Like, like depending on where I move the breath in my body or the thoughts that I think about myself, like the, the rest of my, the rest follows. It's so real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's magic. You know, like we're casting these little spells all the time with our thoughts and words and the way that we look at ourselves. Like, um, yeah, it makes me think of like um, old folk medicine and like potions, um, mm -hmm. snake oils and stuff. And like, you know, maybe there's nothing inherently um, beautifying about uh, some traditional beauty potion, but the very the the instructions of just like lovingly touching your face and saying an incantation of like I am the most beautiful person in the world whatever it is mm -hmm. it's like that works because you you feel it and you make it so and what a beautiful thought to think you know rather than staring at yourself in the mirror and zooming in on those enlarged pores that you wish would go away and just like just immediately magnetizing your focus to whatever is wrong you know because then you make those more real right you're almost reminding me of that what the bleep do we know movie i haven't seen that oh man it was a big deal in 2003 it mm -hmm. was you know all kinds of you know a mix between folk wisdom and pseudoscience and there was it popularized the work of that scientist who said you know if you write nice words on water then mm. the crystalline structure of it um, becomes beautiful and sort of crystalline as opposed to if you sit and shout at water that I hate you, it's sort of the chemical, the, the, it gets very kind of messy, mm. like under a microscope. Mm. And I don't know if the science on that is real. You know, I'm I don't either. I have I'm, heard that. I've heard about that study, and I've looked into it and found very dubious reports. But it's a beautiful thought, and I believe in the concept. But even right. though, even if that specific study is not real, mm -hmm. I I think that is a real thing. I sort of try and be like real skeptical and maybe almost atheistic from like the neck up, but then like from the neck down and the heart, like it's all just like almost every you know everything beautiful is allowed kind of thing. Yes, that's a really good policy. And um, yeah, you got you got to draw the line somewhere, and I guess I draw it right around here. Uh, <laughs> like like Chinamasta, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Chinamasta. Mm -mm. Um, she's one of like the tantric wisdom goddesses, and she has no head. Mm -hmm. She holds her own head, and she holds her own head, and like the streams of blood flow out into the mouths of other goddesses, and it's sort of. She, very kind of passionate and ecstatic yes. and I, I feel like That's to start right. talking about her would would deviate from our course i will hold her in yeah. my headless heart nice um what about how's your music going what's happening with your music it's going you know it's been a really interesting time um because I, I was planning to be on tour right now for the foreseeable future because i put out a record earlier this year so this this whole year really would have been like the promotional tour cycle um but that's obviously not happening so it's been really um unexpectedly blissful to not be on the road as i have been for the better part of the last decade like um, when my tour got canceled, I felt nothing but pure unadulterated relief. Like I, there's no part of me that's like, oh, wouldn't it be nice? I wish I was in that alternate universe. I'm like so grateful to be chilling because um, it's pretty brutal. You know, that the touring musician life is not for the faint of heart. It's um, or the right. faint of body. Just it's it's pretty exhausting. So I'm anyway, I'm I'm very happily homesteading in rural Wales right now, just mm -hmm. slowing way down and I guess just kind of working on my relationship to music and realizing that I have been kind of caught in this um, capitalistic trap because I made my profession out of something that I love and at one point had a very pure relationship to mm -hmm. and I think that's just kind of a classic um, dilemma that a lot of people find themselves in a lot of artists where suddenly this thing that was your liberation is now this chain around your neck and you've got 
um, expectations and obligations and um, your livelihood depends on it. So you don't, it doesn't matter if you don't feel like doing it, you kind of have to, or you tell yourself you have to. So that's what I'm kind of um, recovering from is just this self-created trap and um, just kind of reassessing, like, is that something that I would ever want to return to now that I've realized how bad it was for me in a lot of ways. Um, but at this point, you know, it's been kind of like a three month break I've taken, mm -hmm. just barely playing at all. And now slowly the desire is coming back to just play for joy, mm -hmm. which is a feeling that has been gone for a long time. And I didn't even really consciously register that. Interesting. I am hearing variations on this theme every week. Wow. You know. I'm not surprised. And the it makes me wonder what is a sustainable and joy producing model of musicianship look like? Mm. Yeah, it's it's been weighing on me for a long time, you know, just the um, the hypocrisies of being someone who cares about the future of our planet and um, uh, carbon footprints and um, yet engaging in this way of life that requires you financially to be in a different city every night. So just burning a ton of fossil fuels, um, putting your body through inhumane stresses. Yeah, it's, it, I, I am leaning towards sort of just an old bardic tradition way of being of just, you know, before cars and planes existed, maybe you would still wander, but in a sustainable way, like on foot with your guitar and your little sack and, mm -hmm. um, you know, relying on the kindness of strangers, just showing up to a community, sharing some songs, getting fed and moving on. Um, Cause I think that's a sacred role and it's one that I'm interested in holding, but yeah, without the, the, um, pain inflicted on my body and the massive carbon footprint that's right. completely unsustainable. But also like the live streaming thing, it's weird, but it kind of works, you know, it fills some need. I think mm -hmm. live music is incredible and very important. But the thing is, there are so many people in the world. There's so many, like just in your local 10 mile radius area, I'm sure there are several highly skilled and talented musicians who right. could provide a live music experience you know mm -hmm. so we we probably don't need to be flying to a different country every day right yeah it <laughs> makes me very very curious um because I'm, I'm moving right now i used to live in marin county which is like where we're which is where deadhead land is centered and there's just you know not only members of the grateful dead live here but um all of these side musicians like like a, it's an amazing array where you can go to a venue for free little to no money and see these amazing mm -hmm. people who have had amazing careers that you've never even heard of yeah you know, they were just playing in the background of somebody famous and shredding they were just ripping it up in an amazing way and you sort of get to know um kind of deeper stories around that Mm -hmm. And being that I'm moving somewhere kind of like small town rural, like I'm very curious, like mm -hmm. what is what is the music life like there? It's a big, it's a big shift, which. Um, yes, probably amazing. That is such a positive um, frame to look at this situation through. And what, what it makes me think of what you just said is about food, um, the food politics and the, how messed up our global food system is because it's like the difference between going to a grocery store and buying an imported mango from Mexico um, that is it doesn't even grow in your local area and it's definitely not in season versus going out and foraging in your local forest and like you know maybe finding a kind of berry that you have never tasted before that grows in your backyard you know there's like amazing 
treasures that are growing abundantly all around us and mm -hmm. it's just because we are caught in these capitalist traps that we think we need everything available to us at all times from all over the world and we need like whatever is the the buzzy band of the moment to come and do their dance for us or else we'll we'll have to be out. yeah mm -hmm. it's all it's all so silly <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 super it's super silly. Um, <laughs> that's well said. And with the other thing that you're reminding me of, I'm not sure like if you're familiar with Ayurveda. Yeah. Yeah, that like you know when we travel fast from place to place and then shout, you know, so it's like like what you're you're describing like a, a condition of vata aggravation. Mm. You have to run around in in a vehicle um, every day. And then to just shout and use your voice and sing every night mm -hmm. is just high vata, high vata, high vata. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when I was kind of starting to study this. And I watched the documentary about the Ramones, Joey Ramone. Mm -hmm. And you could sort of watch that he was dying from vata aggravation. Like the road, wow. like the road killed Joey Ramone. Wow. It happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you like, you know, it's like, what does it look like if you like your musicians healthy? Yeah. Because there's almost this romanticized idea of, you know, the, the musician is sort of the, like, it's almost sacrificial. Yes. This yes. live fast, die young, good looking corpse. You know, the, mm. the, the, the 27 year old curse, you know, that got everyone from Kurt Cobain to Jimi Hendrix. It's so fetishized. Mm -hmm. It's really insidious, too, because I remember being um, a teenager and like kind of wishing that upon myself, you know, thinking mm -hmm. like if I want to be great, that's where I have to end up. That's where I want to end up. Like I want to die before I get old. So people will always remember me as a hot young rebel, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think that's it. from some kind of like, um, I don't know, like I, I don't want to go into like conspiracy theory land, but zooming out and thinking about, you know, if there are these kind of archetypal forces of like good and evil or awakening and counter awakening or however you want to frame it like that feels like a really insidious effective efficient form of oppression on behalf of that oppressive force you know to convince the bright young rebellious talented people of the world that they if they do their job right, they should be dead by 27, you know? You know right. what I'm saying? I know what you're saying. And I want to, I would love to like deconstruct the binary that you set up. Mm. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> right. Because you said the good versus evil sort of thing. I mean, it's my sense mm -hmm. that there are ar archetypal forces at play and that that, that these sort of ecstasy and sacrifice is part of that. You know, because there's a certain ecstasy to kind of channeling the gods, you know, if you will, to channeling the wisdom of the gods, um, you know, or the or these kind of large forces through oneself that can drive somebody into various forms of insanity and or self destruction. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that existed, and I could be wrong. I'm just I'm riffing here. Um, I think that that existed before the Illuminati mm. and whether or not, you know, for lack of a better word, and, yeah. you know, whether or not the Illuminati has decided to sort of co-op that and sort of push that narrative forward. Um, mm. I sort of feel like it existed before them. And yeah. it's nice to see people sort of like, like the Julia Cameron, you're familiar with Julia Cameron? No. She wrote The Artist's Way. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it's sort of this 12-step program for recovering artists. And, mm. you know, she sort of takes apart the idea that, like, oh, I have to be a drunk or a drug addict or unhealthy in order to create my art. Mm. 
So there's a certain sustainability there. And like, what are the tools that we use to nurture the artist within so that it can kind of stay healthy and vibrant? Yeah. Yeah. I've only read excerpts from that book, but I love the excerpts and I should mm -hmm. read the whole thing. So thank you for that reminder. Totally. So what do you think about that as sort of art, you know, the musician as archetypal force and how that sort of moves into those other themes and how do we wind our way through all that? Well, something that I've been thinking and talking about with my partner a lot in the last couple of weeks is actually um, Jesus Christ as a figure and the the fixation that our collective fixation on the crucifixion and like this um how that narrative is told and what it does to us to have that image constantly broadcast like instead of you know an image of him healing someone or performing a miracle um or sitting under a tree attaining enlightenment like it, it's it's really interesting to me that um, it kind of feels like a warning on behalf of the government or the, the, the system, whoever, mm. whoever killed Jesus, you know, that mm -hmm. whatever that was that still is alive and well on planet Earth, whatever that per perfectly was. willing to kill him again. Yeah, like we've seen this happen and it's found different ways of cloaking itself and convincing us every time that like that person did it to themselves, you know, like he died for your sins. And it's like, well, did he really like make that choice? Like, cause it seems like y'all murdered him, you know? Right. And then like- He <laughs> died, in, died in police custody. Exactly, yeah. Like the, yeah, the autopsy was inconclusive, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, it, so to me, there's just something really deep in there that I, I haven't quite found like my crystallized thesis about yet, but I'm just like, huh, like how interesting that like, if you are a radical hippie lover of all beings, who's just out there preaching this message of radical compassion and peace, um, that seems to be what happens to you? And the fact that that, that that imagery is like at the center of Christianity is just really fascinating to me. Um, right. So yeah, I don't know with, and I see a connection there with what we're talking about with um, the Kurt Cobains and Elliot Smiths of, right. of the world is like, you know, these, these heroes that are then like, it's like their, their deaths are just the cherry on top, like of this perfect, Sunday of um, martyrdom and like mm -hmm. dead hero worship, you know? And it's all right. just kind of twisted. Right. I mean, even Prince was into like radical care of the community. Mm. Now, that, now that you mention it, you know, and he, he died a little bit later, but he was constantly, you know, investing in programs for, you know, social programs, mm. like all, all around the globe. Like he would, he would travel to cities and throw like a huge concert and make a ton of money and then give a lot of it away to mm. uh, oh but, but so that aside would can you compare this sort of the you know this this jesus archetype to the hanged man card and i know that we're mm. going kind of way off for maybe some of our listeners but you're a tarot reader mm. right mm. Uh, and so the hanged man card sort of has a crucifixion happening upside down in some in many mm. many cards mm. and so i'm just curious and i believe i read in alice one of alistair crowley's books that the crucifixion was required for the age of pisces but not mm. for the age of aquarius mm. as we move into our a new epoch of consciousness the idea of of crucifixion is not quite as necessary for consciousness and its its mm. development as as it was wow i have not heard that but that's good to hear <laughs> 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 yeah yeah that i mean the hanged man is definitely one of the most mysterious cards to me in that it's it, it's um it can mean 
it's opposite depending on the circumstance. And I guess that's true of all of them, but that one in particular, I feel like it's so context-based for me, just um, it can mean, and, and it's, it's so affected by whether it's inverted or upright and because when it's inverted, it actually does look upright because he's upside down. So Great. there's just kind of this riddle built into that image of like, is he, um, is he an enlightened master or is he um, a criminal or both or like, you know, like all of the above, like, is he, is he dead? Is he a, like, um, transcending the um, illusion. Um, so yeah, I just, and I think maybe that's, it's all of those things are um, wrapped up in each other because to attain enlightenment, you have to go through so many deaths of the smaller self and the ego self. So, you know, to, to transcend, you have to embrace your own downfall. Right. So let's swing that all back to like you as a medicine woman and your experiences of having little deaths in order to grow into the being that you're becoming. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If you don't mind <laughs> or anything else Not you feel all. like talking about. Not at all. No, I'm like, whoa, just, yeah, like, whoo, coming back, coming back to <laughs> I'm like, who am I? <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. What do you want to know? Just what I had. Well, that wasn't. I have to say it again. <laughs> I don't know. What's the question? Like, can can you compare yourself to Jesus Christ? <laughs> or the, to, to compare yourself, you know, to the archetype. You know, our Jesus Christ as archetype or symbol. Hanged man as symbol. Uh, you were talking about the many little deaths we have to go through to re to achieve consciousness mm. and enlightenment. Mm. Mm. Um, what's coming to mind um, is, I guess, to get back on topic and talk about psychedelics specifically, um, the last time that I sat with ayahuasca, which I've only done a couple times and each one has been incredibly intense. Um, the last time I really thought I was dying. Like I, I really, um, because I'm, I have type one diabetes. So that is sort of a complicated physiological situation that, um, actually the shamans that I was sitting with were really concerned and kind of almost didn't let me sit because they just didn't have experience with it. And they had to call a doctor friend to make sure to like get his um, approval. And I was like, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I, I, I believe this is right for me right now. But there was definitely that, that seed of fear that was planted because there was that sort of, um, convincing that I had to do. So anyway, things got really um, dark for a minute where like literally like m my entire field of vision just became flooded with just the blackest night that I've ever seen, just like the darkest dark. Mm -hmm. And and then all these little skulls came out and lined up in a row and just started rattling. And awesome. yeah, and I was just like, this is it, man. This is like, I'm, this is it. I'm dead. And then as soon as I kind of pushed through the fear and surrendered to death, then everything became really warm and gentle and sweet. And like the grandmotherly voice came in and just kind of swaddled me and said, um, um, you have been holding death's hand since you were born <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and straddling that line is the shaman's path. And that's what you're here to do is speaking specifically to this condition that I was um, given as a young child, this 
very liminal condition that often has me going into sort of near death experiences and um, comatose states and everything. Um, she was saying that that is, um, it's kind of, you know, tying into sort of like the wounded healer archetype that like you've been given this thing. And I know it seems like kind of a burden a lot of the time, but it's actually, the, it's a gift. And mm -hmm. you, you're you invited to um, come deeper on, on this path. Like whether that means, you know, she, like, she was like, you don't have to come to the jungle, but you're invited, <laughs> um, but you can do whatever, whatever you want to do, just make sure that you hold that, um, that role in the center of your awareness of just having one foot in and one foot out um, and bridging the gap. So she was like, you know, whether it's coming to the jungle and learning more about me or going on and playing your little songs for rooms full of people, like just make sure that that's what you're doing mm -hmm. um, and so how does that come through in your music i think it's it i feel it like viscerally like i feel like i'm opening a portal for myself to kind of when i'm doing it right i will say because I'm not always like sometimes I'm completely trapped in um, anxiety and like my smaller self and just like tripping out about like, am I doing this right? Am I performing proficiently? What are they thinking about me? <laughs> um, but when I'm really in it and doing my job correctly, I feel like I'm a bridge between worlds because I, because of the disease that I was given as a young child, I have been granted access to these death portals mm -hmm. for a long time, like where I've, I've had so many near death experiences. I feel like I've, I know that place very well and I've grown actually quite comfortable in it. Mm -hmm. And I recognize that that is not the case for our culture in general. Like, I think we do not live in a death positive society and to me death is really beautiful and I, I, I have seen just these beyond beautiful images and landscapes and heard this celestial music that is outside of my ability to recreate or translate as a, a human but that is the goal now, you know, like, and has been for a, a long time, like being granted access to these visionary states has shown me, it's like put me in contact with this um, level of beauty that then it's, it's been like my aspiration to try to just even get close to touching mm -hmm. a, a, <laughs> a tiny point of that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I'm curious, what are some of the adjunct practices that you do to help stay, stay? Because, you know, I, well, yeah, because ayahuasca is like not a daily thing for most of us. We don't do that. Every, uh, that would be a, a bit much. What are the supportive practices that help you kind of stay in touch with that beauty of which you speak? Mm. Um, my foundational spiritual practice is Reiki. Mm -hmm. um, which I think it's it's one of those things where if you're lucky enough to come into contact with someone who is really in touch with that and what that means in its pure form and has come from a, a strong lineage or just has a real connection to it, like that's such a gift. And unfortunately, I think there it has become its own kind of, um, uh business where like a lot of a lot of people like maybe just have a certificate and aren't actually really doing the thing but they're calling it the thing so i i say this only as a disclaimer because i think a lot of people have this like skepticism of reiki when they hear that word they're just like oh like i tried it and it, i didn't feel anything whatever well i mean i i just in a to agree with you i've had sessions with people and come out feeling worse and I've had sessions yeah. with people and come out feeling 
like I've received a, a deep and profound healing. Yeah. Yeah. And to be fair, sometimes, you know, the healing process goes, it, it acts on its own logic and sometimes feeling worse is part of the big picture of ultimately feeling better eventually. Well, it came, it, I realized that every time I saw that person, I felt worse. Yeah. There's, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm aware that a healing crisis is sort of, is a thing sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. But you were but saying, you were, you're, uh, yeah. you, the disclaimer aside, tell me more about the Reiki. Yeah. Um, I had the great fortune of, find, of finding a true teacher who, um, yeah, is it, it, amazing. And my experience of Reiki is just this pure, benevolent light of existence that I think, you know, it's the, it's key, chi, the same thing that um, Taoist practitioners have been cultivating for long before Reiki was a thing. It's just this um, vital life force that mm -hmm. permeates the whole universe. And it's just this pure light of awareness and love and vitality that um, has all of this just encoded wisdom about healing and what that looks like. And sometimes it doesn't follow um, the course that our logical egoic mind might want it to. Sometimes death is involved, you know, sometimes there's like, it's the wisdom of nature that knows what is for the highest and best of the whole collective organism. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, it's just, it feels infinitely trustworthy to me because when I tap into that place, it is so surrender based and it's like the remedy for my kind of anxious controlling brain, especially in um, performance when I can think like, oh my God, this agent is in the crowd. So I have to be on my A game. Like this has to, I have this picture in my mind of how this has to go. And if it doesn't, then I'm going to feel like a failure, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if I just really take the time to tune into the, reiki consciousness of like just a, a sincere prayer from the heart that may i be of service to you oh great benevolent light who knows exactly what it's doing mm -hmm. i don't have to know and maybe for reasons that i can't possibly foresee or understand maybe i need to like technically fail or like flub or flounder and humiliate myself for the benefit of someone in the crowd who's maybe like for whatever reason that's exactly what they need to see you know mm -hmm. like maybe they maybe they were gonna go like kill themselves but because they saw you vulnerably publicly fail they were in, encouraged and emboldened to like do the thing that they were feeling too scared to do or whatever you know like there's just tuning into this bigger eagle's eye consciousness that knows what you can't possibly know it just right. feels like such a relief and it opens up so much space for trust and faith and gratitude um for whatever reality is <laughs> yeah for sure and so well, the other question i've been holding on to that's i mean before i get there that's that's super well said and just sort of also reminds me that yeah, I mean, playing for the light, you know, definitely seems like it would be much different than playing for an agent. Yes, yes, <laughs> profoundly, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like you know, screw those guys. I'm sure they're, I'm sure you're great, but you know, screw those guys. You know, in comparison yeah. to you know, kind of what we're really here to do. Yes, because say I played for the agent, played the show that that agent wanted to see got that deal and then you know that ends up incapacitating me you know contractually i find myself in a situation where i'm actually not really able to be of service anymore in the way that i need to be you right. know like that's that's where it's like i might my ego might think and my my limited sense of um awareness at this moment might think that's what I want. That's like, please, please light, like, just give me that record deal. But mm -hmm. 
it might be the opposite of what's actually needed and how I'm what's actually for the highest and best of all, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I also, I don't necessarily think that the light by definition wants you to not be successful. Not at all. <laughs> no, actually. It's not it's like, like one or the other. No, no. And I think, you know, there are certain certain aspects of what we've all been conditioned to think success looks like that are more than ready to die mm -hmm. and that's a lot of a lot of work you know to free ourselves from those constructs and really you know open to what what does success look like when our world is dying you know like we need to we need to reframe success to include the um the future thriving of all life you know mm -hmm. and um maybe there's more important things that i could be concerning myself with than whether i get that record deal or not you know and maybe there's actually more effective ways that i could be of service to the continued thriving of life on earth and so that's that's where it all comes in that's all, like the faith and surrender part is like if i make myself available to a force that i choose to believe in that exists that knows what is needed to bring healing to a situation and then just let that do the work then right. <laughs> just es yeah especially if there's that wounded healer archetype at play definitely um which makes me curious like if there are people who feel like they have the wounded healer thing going on for them other people you know it's like many of us are not you know have have some sort of struggle you know some sort of issue that might make us feel that way what is your thoughts or your advice or or or, or for them hmm. um love the wound be grateful for the the wound as the initiation and the the blessing and learn to he learn how to heal it so that then you can share that you know i think that's the gift it's like we're given suffering so that we can guinea pig ourselves you know and not like just hurt a lot of people while we try to figure our shit out with no direct mm -hmm. experience it's like you are given whatever it is because we're all given suffering you know i think that archetype applies to everyone because we all have the innate capacity to heal and we're all given a lot of suffering at birth inherently life is traumatic on planet earth in 2020 so mm -hmm. But that's, it's an amazing thing because, you know, we have the opportunity to figure it out within ourselves and then to be of service. And that doesn't mean, you know, going out and like proselytizing and, you know, thinking that just because it worked for me means it's going to work for everybody because that's not true. But um, there are some, some core truths that I think are pretty universal, such mm -hmm. as, you know, the need for love and community and purpose and um and i think if you the thing about the self is it's so vast like i am you and everyone else so if i really dig deep and learn how to love my larger self you know then i i really have um healed my relationship to the world because um as long as i'm holding on to like self-judgment uh, that's really just a judgment for a whole group of other people that I'm um, that I'm internalizing, you know. So I think, I yeah, if we do the the work on the macrocosm, it'll happen on the microcosm and vice versa. One of the things that I think is really cool about everything we've been talking about, and you know, a lot of the philosophies you're sharing, is that there's a fair amount of kind of free play and trust and sort of this uh, you know this i think what we're dealing with in some ways is chaos and you know i couldn't help but notice that your album is called chaotic good which those of us who are sort of have a, D, a history in D and D, some D and D ner nerdiness to us, you know, are familiar with that phrase and and kind of what that means, but also you know, sort of in the larger scheme of you know, kind of chaos theory or chaos magic or um, um, discordianism, all of those sorts of things. Like it's kind of all wrapped up in this kind of freedom and acceptance and willingness to sort of go where one is led. Yes. So. Yes. 
Yes, yes, alignment. <laughs> that's that's really what it's all about. Like that's that Reiki thing of just like, who are you working for? What do you believe in enough to make yourself fully available to that, you know? And I think whatever you want to call it, whether it's God or nature or the light or whatever, just that's something that I really encourage everyone to do too, is just find that thing, find whatever it is that you really believe in. And I think it's the thing that we all do know. And it's like an issue of semantics and language, like broken, broken language that makes us mm-hmm. argue about this thing, <laughs> this like, I think love, even that word is so triggering for so many people, you know, it's like, when you say I love everyone, it's like, what do you love Donald Trump? And it's like, well, yes, on some level, yes, I do. That doesn't mean I condone his actions and choices, but I, I can recognize on some basic level that he is alive. There is, he was a baby once. There is a light of consciousness somewhere deep, deep inside him that I, I bow to, you know? And well, I just, or I just, I love him because I just love. And yes. it just like, like the sun, you know, the Gayatri mantra is really nice. You know, the, the, the idea mm-hmm. of, you know, kind of the Vedic sun worship is that the sun is the friend to all. And it just mm-hmm. sort of shines friendliness and devotion um it's all sanskrit's really nice because they're like 75 words for love mm, yes yes yeah. yes yes but you were saying yeah oh i don't even know i don't yeah well, we were talking about chaos too i was i wanted to hear a little yes. about cha- chaos and love mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Hmm. Chaos can be really productive, you know, like, I think there's something about just like shaking things up, you know, stagnation is the enemy. Stagnation is when um, stuff starts to get stinky, you know, like (laughs) when the mosquitoes come out and start laying their eggs and um, things fester, you know, you got to keep it moving. So sometimes, sometimes a little chaotic streak just just to stir things up is a really good thing right also just keeps it exciting Mm -hmm. i would love to hear further thoughts from you about chaos if you have any you'd like to share uh further thoughts on chaos well i am not um I, I don't tend towards the orderly. Hmm. You know, there, there's interesting ways that, you know, sort of my my wounded healer kind of thing has got to do with kind of disorganization and like AD, ADHD, which maybe isn't even really the best term for it. But, you know, the kind of keeping things on track is tricky and sort of also kind of creating a structure where it's safe for chaos to f- flourish and do its thing um, where it can actually be a force for healing and good Mm. right and so it's like what does you know you were talking about how it's productive and just sort of the kind of the inspiration and the excitement and the willingness to kind of fail or make a mess or look silly Mm. um, knowing that this is kind of ultimately going to be of service is a really interesting mode and you know it's kind of like a really um neat thing to try to model for my clients sometimes Mm. um you know because i do a lot of you know coaching work and and even if it's not psychedelic integration coaching you know it might be folks who have been very very successful by following rules and doing things that are orderly and doing what they have been told they're supposed to do. And that works really well until it doesn't anymore. Yeah. And they found themselves stuck in some sort of box, Mm -hmm. not unlike the box, the box of grids that the hanged man is, is hanging on. Um, And then letting Mm -hmm. people know that like, you can actually just, 
think for your decide for yourself what you want for yourself and then attempt mm -hmm. to do things to try and get that and i'm not talking about like super selfish things i'm just like people are trying to just get along and live their lives but it didn't occur to them that like there were different options for them and that stepping outside of their prescribed role and what they were taught they were allowed to do can look like chaos. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, this time, I think the pandemic definitely shook, shook up a lot of those boxes because it's like you think you've found security, um, but it's it's so illusory because as soon as something real happens, like a global pandemic, all of those um, false refuges crumble and you're mm -hmm. suddenly free falling. So the, I think there's a lot of wisdom in getting comfortable with a certain level of chaos because that's the real, that's the only real security you can ever have in life. It's just, is non-attachment and mm -hmm. learning to be okay with not knowing. Cause you never, you never really know, even when you think you do. And like, when, as soon as you think you do look out. <laughs> right. Kind of like you were saying, you know, death is like held your hand this whole time. You know, mm -hmm. it's like our life is sort of on loan. Yeah. Yeah. And there's something really nice about, you know, the way psychedelics can sort of rub your nose in that in such a way that will teach you how to laugh about it yeah you know it's like be able to laugh at the madness of um like kind of the horror of our predicament mm. <laughs> of, of being a kind of hurtling through the unknown yes <laughs> so are there any sort of last sort of um thoughts or gems or stories that you would want to leave our folks with mm. thank you for asking um yeah i'll go back to ayahuasca land please i just saw a little hummingbird in my mind and that reminded me of um a really beautiful teaching that came from my first experience with ayahuasca which um i think it was it was very personal like custom tailored to what i've got going on with my body but i think it's relevant to everyone mm -hmm. um, because so i have type 1 diabetes which means my body can't digest sweetness um like it can't break down the food that i eat to access the sugars in the food and the sugars end up just crystallizing in my blood and becoming a big problem and ultimately killing you if you don't take insulin. Um, so I had gone into this ceremony with the intention of just asking, is there anything I can do about this? Or just, um, I wanna learn more about what's happening on an energetic spiritual level. And um, uh, one, yeah, one thing that came up was this hummingbird guide who was showing me that um, that inability to digest sweetness on a physiological level is connected to an emotional thing, which is, I think, sort of like a happiness anxiety that I, I know a lot of people suffer from too, which is just like, things might be good, but I don't know how to enjoy that. I do not know how to just like let things be good because I'm so caught up in my frenetic anxious problem seeking mind which is an evolutionary thing you know it's like um, the negativity bias you know we're so hardwired to constantly be scanning for a threat um, something we should be aware of to protect ourselves but it really prevents us from being happy a lot of the time and just at peace so yeah this little hummingbird was just showing me like you know it dipped its beak into a flower and just showed me that that is an action that can be taken in every moment like in every moment there is this nectar core of existence that we can access and um that's the medicine you know she, she was like you need to learn how to make this nourishment not not a problem like look around you look how many beautiful gifts you're being given in this moment and 
like just tap into that nectar sweetness and nourish yourself with that. Right. That mm -hmm. is, um, I mean, that's good medicine for everybody. In I think story. so. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Do you want to um, share a little bit about folk med? Yes, yes. Um, if yes, for those of you listening live right now, it's um, happening this Thursday, the sixteenth. Um, it's a benefit con concert for the peoples of the Amazon River Basin who have been impacted by COVID and just do not have um, government infrastructure to support them right now. And it's a it's a pretty dire situation. So we're playing a live stream benefit to raise money to assist them. And it's, um, I think it's 5 p.m. Pacific time on this Thursday. And you can get um, digital tickets at folkmed.org. Yeah, the first one was really good. I'm glad you guys are continuing to keep it going. And then what about like other people who want to just connect with you otherwise, you know, for, for healing or magic or wisdom or music thank you, thank you so much yeah my, I, have, I have a website that's just johannawarren.com and i do um, remote healing sessions that are so beautiful they're honestly one of my favorite things to do in the world just um distance reiki sessions we just find a time together to tune in and then i send you uh, written notes or we can have a phone call um just to send along whatever comes through for me um, and hear what you experienced. And uh, yeah, I do I do vocal coaching and all kinds of things that's all on my website. And my music is available and that's, I always, it's like, I always forget that. It's like, oh yeah, that's <laughs> like this very densely encoded offering of myself that is available on right. the, on the internet. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. It was nice to warm up listening to it this morning. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure and I'm really grateful that you reached out. Yeah, this was this was a delight. This was really rich. I, I appreciate it. Um, thank you. And I love yeah. what you're doing. It's just, it's such a cool concept and I'm really excited to listen to more episodes. Yeah, we did one with um, Tony, who you performed with, Tony Moss, and we did one with oh, Santaro. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Blessings. Blessings to you. Blessings to all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.